Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank you all for joining us today in our continuing education series. Today, our future topic is fusion splicers and types of splicers. My name is Jessica Petrohoy, and I'm the marketing coordinator at fiberoptic.com. Fiberoptic.com is a leading provider of fiber optic products, training, and rental equipment. And we are pleased to present this topic to you today. With us today to talk about fusion splicers is Terry Power. Terry is one of our senior instructors and a field technician with over 25 years in managing and testing networks. When Terry is finished, we will take questions from the GoToWebinar question box at the bottom of the screen for a question and answer session. Remember that our webinar series are recorded and available to you online at fiberoptic.com slash webinar. Today's webinar will be available for on-demand viewing within one week. Thank you again for joining us today, and at this time, I turn the presentation over to Terry. And good day, everybody. This is Terry Power, our Senior Instructor and International Training Manager here at the Fiber School. And as Jessica said, I have been in the field for about 25 years. I started doing cable TV in 1987. I uh, grew up with fiber in the field as it got more and more uh, pushed out into the cable TV infrastructure. Uh, by 2007, I was the outside plant coordinator at Tele Barbados, and they sent me to this facility for a training session. I uh, met the president of the company here a couple of years later. I moved back to North America and I was put on staff here and I have uh, run crews in New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, done testing all around the US and a good bit of, the, of Latin America, as well as repair work uh, within the US and uh, as far away as Haiti and Panama. So uh, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and get started. We're going to talk about fusion splicers and splicer types. Our agenda today, we're going to talk about safety, we're going to talk about fiber geometry, one slide, a little reminder, uh, why do we splice, an introduction to splicing, we're going to talk about fiber preparation, we're going to talk about the splicer operation, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between lids and PAS and the core alignment technologies. And we're going to talk about splicing quality and some tips for fusion splicing. And we're going to end up with a few considerations on how to select the fusion splicer that meets your needs. Uh, fiber optic or splicing safety. Remember that fusion splicers use a high voltage arc. It's, it's very hot and in certain environments with explosive gases in the air, this could uh, potentially cause a boom. So uh, you want to be conscious, uh, petrochemical plants, uh, mining operations, uh, splicing near uh, large manholes. Uh, sometimes you'll get explosive gases will even accumulate in those manholes. So you want to make sure that you're testing the environment around your workspace before you arc. Also, you want to be aware that the fiber shards are very sharp and have the potential for getting poked into your skin. Uh, worst case would be getting something to fly up into your eye and then you're at an optical surgeon having, you know, having surgery on your eyeball. Uh, so safety glasses are always going to be a concern. You don't want to empty your shards into a trash can. You'd rather, you want to use a approved container because as surely as you drop it in the trash, you're going to drop a fiber holder in there and you're going to have to go digging around amongst all those shards. And that's usually going to drive the pieces of glass into your skin. It will usually break off instead of pulling out smoothly. And uh, so at that point you will you know, come out looking like a porcupine attacked you or something and it will be painful for a couple of weeks. Also you want to make sure and follow any of the OSHA safety requirements 
state and local governments, any of your company safety policies. All right, fiber geometry. Uh, every fiber has three basic layers. You've got the core, which in single mode is typically eight to 10 or nine plus or minus one micron. The multi-mode is 50 or 62.5 uh, microns. And then the cladding diameter in telecommunications is typically 125 microns. There are some smaller uh, size uh, claddings out there. They're uh, for specialty cables uh, used in harsh environments uh, with special connectors. But typically what we use in the field uh, working with telecommunications is going to be the standard 125 micron uh, cladding diameter. And outside of that, you're going to have an acrylate coating uh, with loose tube, uh, single mode uh, fiber out in the field. Uh, that's usually going to be the color code is going to be in the acrylate coating. Uh, if you're working with indoor cable, there may be an additional buffer layer on top, which would have the color code in that uh, tight buffer. And the acrylate coating would be a clear or milky color. All right, so why are we splicing? Uh, we're joining two or more fibers into a continuous light path. Uh, this could be required because of the length of the system. Reels of cable are only so long and be practical. So uh, we may pull off five kilometer reels and have to put them together end to end. Uh, the cable plant layout may cause may call for uh, splitting off of fibers going in different directions. You might have a 432 leaving the head end, hit a splice enclosure and split and go in three different directions with 144s and that's going to cause uh, the need for a splice enclosure and for fusion splicing at that location. And of course system restoration. Uh, we know that once the plant is up and running, it is pretty much going to stay that way until it's um, uh, inhibited by tractor trailers, backhoes, uh, some old man with a post hole digger, uh, one meter augers setting uh, digging holes to set lamps along the, or, uh, lamp posts along the highway, any number of things that, that we've all experienced uh, that will cause the fiber to get busted up in the field. So a fusion splicing loss can be as low as dot zero one. And I've seen a lot of zero zeros. Splices I simply could not see with an OTDR. When we think about our loss budget and we're looking at connector losses can be as great as dot two five. Uh, I think uh, ITU even allows up to dot five and it's still past specs. So we can have some pretty substantial differences. Uh, doesn't take but three or four connectors and our, our loss budget is gone. It's, it's torn completely up. And so mechanical splices are a little better than connectors. So fusion splicers are going to be the way to go. Uh, just for the loss budget, if you can eliminate connectors, if you don't need to make changes at a particular location, it makes way more sense to use a fusion splice rather than connectors. Now some of the splicer applications. Uh, we've already mentioned through splices between reel spans. Transition splicing for distribution. Now, high bandwidth applications. I want to hit on this a little more. Uh, fusion splices are non-reflective events. And in a world where we are pushing more and more and more ones and zeros, as fast as we can, um, any amount of reflection with high power lasers and high bandwidth, uh, that, that just becomes more and more of a problem. We're out there doing everything we can to build special connectors to try to mitigate reflection. It makes no sense to do anything other than a fusion splice, which is going to be non-reflective by its very nature. 
Once those two pieces of glass are melted together, they're a single piece of glass, there's no uh, discontinuity in the index of refraction causing any reflection back. And that makes it a whole lot easier to get these higher bandwidths. Uh, also, you might end up using pre-connectorized pigtails uh, coming in from the outside plant, terminating at the back of a cabinet. Uh, I used to very often use uh, pre-connectorized pigtails. They're factory polished. Uh, everything is set up nice and neat. You've got a, a quick uh, quick fusion splice and everything's up and running. A field termination of single mode fibers just doesn't make any sense uh, in today's world. And then of course you've got splice on connectors that you can use instead of pigtails but frankly I consider those to be short little stubby pigtails in the final analysis. All right, so what is a fusion splicer? It is a piece of equipment that is used to, to cause an arc and a controlled melting of the uh, fiber optic or the optical fiber. Once that uh, fiber is melted slightly, it's gonna step the fibers together, it's going to cool rapidly, and you will have a single piece of glass. It is essentially a fiber weld. And once that is done, it is sturdy. Uh, any kind of breaks are going to occur on either side, not usually at the weld itself. As we said earlier, it is a permanent joining of two fibers. It is joined by melding, uh, melting. It is highly reliable. Uh, dot .01 to dot .3 kind of losses. The lowest losses are going to be with your core alignment lids or PAS technologies. Uh, the uh, fixed V-groove are going to have slightly higher losses. And as opposed to any other joining of fibers such as connectors or mechanical splices, uh, fusion splicing is extremely cost effective on large fiber counts. Now ribbon splicing. You know, we've talked a lot about single splices, but a ribbon splice, uh, basically in uh, high density, point to point, a large count kind of connections. It is very cost effective and time saving to use ribbon cable, uh, typically 12 fibers uh, smushed together and glued. Uh, makes a ribbon and you can do one burn versus 12. So in the time it would take you to splice up one buffer tube, you can splice up a 144 count ribbon. Now, like I said, the fibers are typically in 12s, but they do come in 24s. Uh, you'll need some special tools. Uh, one of the jobs we were working on, we were splicing some ribbon into loose tube for uh, road and highway crossings. And I figured out really early that I could uh, have an apprentice use a ribbonizer and make 12 ribbons real quick, or I could do 144 uh, fusion burns in that day. And the uh, cost effectiveness of a ribbonizer uh, pointed itself out very quickly. Uh, sometimes engineers will have you slit a ribbon and want to send four or six or eight in one direction and the rest of them going forward and you do need a special slitting tool in that case. A mid-span access tool uh, with uh, ribbon cable. The unitube construction has a large central buffer tube that is quite rigid and while it's easy to take apart if you're taking off the end if you're doing a mid-span or ring cut, uh, you need a special tool that will slit that uh, central uh, cavity buffer tube. And then the special fiber holders. Uh, while all of these machines that you see up here on the screen will do ribbon, uh, they'll also do single splices and you end up with different fiber holders for 12, 8, 4, 6, or single. So you have some special fiber holders that also need to be accommodated in the ribbon splicing machines. Now, splice protective sleeves. 
I've already mentioned that a, a failure at a splice will occur near the joint, not at the joint. Uh, if it breaks at the joint, it wasn't a good splice to begin with. Uh, the bare fiber there where there's no acrylate coating, no protection, is the weakest point in the link. And we have to put on the splice protective sleeves. Now make sure that you put on the sleeve before you splice. Uh, I've, had, I've had fibers I struggled with and I had to strip them a couple of times, re-cleave. And just as soon as I finally get that one to, to burn and give me a great splice, I realized I have no sleeve on it and I have to break it. So be conscientious about the splice sleeves. Uh, sleeves uh, also reinforce the splices. Uh, there's some standardized sizes, single mode 60 millimeter or 40 millimeter. I like the 60 because it's easier to hit my target and I can move more quickly. Uh, with the ribbon splicing, they've got them for 12 fiber or for 24. It's got like a little half moon spacer, which um, uh, keeps you from crushing the sides of the ribbon when you uh, when you shrink it. All right, fiber preparation, the stripper. Uh, you need to strip away all the jackets, buffer tubes, acrylate coating, everything until you are down to the bare cladding. Uh, there are there any number of tools for this? At the bottom of the screen, you can see the uh, standard one hole Miller stripper for uh, scraping off the acrylate coating in a loose tube environment. Uh, the next two are ribbon strippers. Uh, the one at the top is a hot jacket stripper. And I have, in certain environments, seen that hot jacket stripper used for single loose tube as well. And a hot jacket stripper is built into one of the one of the splicers we'll talk about later, and it's uh, quite handy. Uh, use a lint-free wipe to clean with. Use high purity, 99% isopropyl alcohol. Uh, anything less leaves a whole lot of residue. Uh, if you're in parts of the world where that 99% is hard to get to. Uh, go to the pharmacy and ask for surgical alcohol. Uh, that will typically be 97% or higher. Uh, that cleanliness is absolutely critical for splicing quality and splice strength. I mentioned if the splice fails at the joint, that means it was actually not a good, uh, not a good fuse, and that's usually due to contamination. Okay, after we've cleaned the fiber, we're going to cleave it. We want to produce a square end face. Uh, this is absolutely crucial for getting the splice to be a good one. And it is the last step before we splice. We want to make sure that we don't have any of those uh, three in the lower right. That large angle uh, is dirty pads. We're going to talk about this next month, actually. We're going to be talking about uh, splicer and cleaver maintenance. So next month, tune in for that. But we're going to talk in greater detail about how to avoid those three images uh, under the red X. You want the one that's got that square in face. And uh, if you get a really good cleave, you're going to get a really good splice. And if you don't, you're going home for the day. I don't care if you've got the fanciest machine on the planet. $30,000 splicing machine is supposed to do everything except make coffee. And if you're giving it bad cleaves, it's still going to go, you're still going home for the day. So that $600 cleaver uh, could send you home for the day. So that is your best friend in the field. You want to make sure and take care of it, and we'll talk more. Like the, I said, we'll talk more about that next month. All right, so how a precision cleaver works. Uh, in this drawing, you can see the two pads, two sets of pads on either side. I'm going to bring in a little pointer here. And you can see this set of pads 
and this set of pads. They grip the fiber and hold it firmly. This blade will come under and score the fiber and make just a small nick. Then the anvil will come down and tap it. And when it does, it will cause that flaw caused by the blade to propagate through the fiber and give you that perfectly clean, straight cleave. Okay, so in the final preparation, I want to reiterate that you never clean the fiber after cleaving it. You can put contamination back onto it. The process is you strip the fiber, you clean the fiber, you put the fiber, you cleave the fiber, and then you put the fiber straight into the machine. Do not expect the cleaning arc to help clean up the fiber or to get rid of any little burrs in your cleave. It is only intended to vaporize any of the remaining alcohol and get rid of the uh, residue uh, that's left behind when the alcohol dries. All right, splicer types. We've got the two on the top are our core alignment. The one on the bottom is the fixed V groove. It's the simplest of all of them. And by the way, every ribbon fiber is, or every ribbon splicer is going to be a fixed V groove. We do not have the technology yet to have 48 little motors that will give us core alignment on uh, 12 fibers sitting side by side. So all ribbon splicers, and anytime you're using a ribbon splicer as a single splicer, uh, you are getting a fixed V-groove uh, type of technology. It aligns the clap. There's no cameras, there's no light detection. It takes an, it, it has a camera that does an image of the uh, fiber and looks at the spacing, uh, looks that all of the uh, claddings are aligned. But other than that, there's not much more to it. The profile alignment and the lids uh, use uh, some sort of technology that detects and lines up the core. Uh, the local injection detection bends the fiber and injects light through the acrylate coating. Uh, that little bit of light is then picked up on the other side uh, by bending and letting the light escape from the acrylate coating. And based on the received level on the received detector side, it determines the uh, most precise alignment. Uh, with the profile alignment system, it uses uh, cameras and um, mirrors 90 degrees out, gives you a, an X and Y view, the onboard hardware and computerized stuff, uh, looks at the image from the camera, uh, detects the core, lines them up visually in both X and Y axes, and then it does the fusion. In both of those top two cases, those are going to be your lowest losses because you're aligning the core. Now, fixed V groove, like I said, aligns the cladding. It depends on the cladding being correct, always 150, or 125 rather. If you look at this drawing, you can see that if one of the claddings is slightly larger than the other, the centers are no longer lined up. Uh, the fixed V groove also counts on the fact that you're using a fiber where the core is perfectly centered. Uh, some of the old legacy fiber, pre-97 manufacture, uh, some of it was being hung into the, the mid-2000s, uh, had pretty loose tolerances on core concentricity, on ovality and uh, even the core size. Uh, it was a little looser. Uh, contemporary modern fibers, that's not so much of a problem. Uh, they tightened up on all the core geometry tolerances. And now, unless you've got uh, dust 
temperature issues, humidity, uh, you're going to get a pretty decent splice out of a fixed V groove. Uh, it's just very susceptible to problems from the environment. And it is, uh, of course, the least costly of any of the uh, splicing technologies. Now, the core alignment, uh, whether it's uh, LID or PAS, is going to work either way equally well with the newer or the older legacy fibers. It's going to be more expensive, but it's certainly going to give you the least loss and the highest, uh, you know, highest standards. As you can see from the drawing, if you've got a fiber core that is offset, the machine will line up the cores and the cladding will take care of itself. All right, PAS, Profile Alignment System, uses small video cameras, uh, does an automated alignment and measurement. And as you can see from this drawing, uh, the LED shoots a light up off the mirror, shines it through the fiber, and then the two cameras for the X and Y axes will look at uh, how everything is lined up. When it's determined that everything is smooth and straight, it will arc. And this is an image from a PAS splicer showing you a estimated loss of 0.00. .00. Uh, that loss estimate is very accurate. Uh, the detection of the core is done with the onboard software and uh, newer splicers, uh, some of the newer PAS uh, will even look at uh, core distortions, uh, deformations, bubbles, and bulges in the splice and will even uh, alert you or fail a splice because of it. Some of the strength of the PAS. It is easier to operate. Basically, if you got a good cleave, you feed the fibers to it and it will burn. Uh, it can incorporate altitude and pressure compensation. Some of them do this automatically. Uh, it is fully automatic. You tell it what fiber you're splicing or sometimes it will detect the type of fiber and set the appropriate program for heat and time uh, that is appropriate to that type of fiber. And you can get good results regardless of the fiber types, whatever coating, uh, color, size, as long as it matches on both sides. You're in pretty good shape with a PAS. Now, local injection and detection. Uh, it kinks the fiber on one side. I'm going to bring in my little spotlighter again. And it kinks the fiber over here and shoots it shoots light through the acrylate coating. What light comes through is then detected where it kinks the fiber on the other side letting the light escape through the acrylate coating. The relative power level is detected and as the uh, light increases, it determines that that is the most properly or completely aligned that the fibers are going to get, and it does the uh, does the fusion, and then it will measure the loss through the splice rather than estimate the loss. Now, some of the strengths of the lids. Again, the, uh, the loss estimate will usually detect a bubble at the splice point because it's actually shooting light through the splice. And it measures the loss rather than estimating it as a PAS does. There is one drawback, though. Uh, differences in color or composition of the acrylate coating, uh, some of it is more opaque than others. Some colors are more opaque than, you know, shooting light through black is of course going to be a little more problematic than shooting it through the white fiber or the yellow fiber. So uh, that is one of the drawbacks to the lids is that some uh, acrylate coatings will not allow you to inject light at all. 
So the splicer works by aligning the cores in most cases. And then we heat the fiber using the electrical arc. The melted ends are pushed together, cool rapidly, and you have welded a single piece of fiber. Now the procedure. I got two slides here and I'm going to talk about the procedure for core alignment, v-groove, and on the next slide we're going to talk about ribbon. And I'm going to tell you that the procedure is pretty much the same. No matter what you're doing, you're going to clean well, of course, it doesn't even say on here, but first thing you're going to do is strip the fiber all the way down to the cladding. You're going to then clean the fiber, cleave it, insert the fibers into your clamps or the fiber holders into the machine. The machine is going to look at the cleave angle, determine if it is good or bad. If it's good, it will proceed on to look for dirt and contamination. If it is clean, it will do its alignment. In the case of core alignment, it will use the motors and move an X and Y to perfectly align the cores. With the V groove, it's going to double check that all the cladding's lined up. And once that is done, it will fuse. With the fiber, the difference is going to be your hot jacket stripper. Uh, you're going to clean and cleave. You're going to insert it into the machine. It'll look at the cleave angle. In this case, it'll look at all 12 cleave angles. It will look at uh, contamination. It will look at the alignment of all 12 fibers. It'll look at the offset between them to make sure that everything is lined up the way it's supposed to be. And then it will fuse. All these machines will give you an estimated or a measured loss depending on the technology, uh, telling you if this is a good or a bad splice. And a good splice depends on a few factors. Uh, the fiber feed, nothing's, nothing's holding the fiber from moving in and out with the fusion splicer. The fusion time and the power. Uh, Multi-mode fibers burn longer and slower at a lower temperature, whereas the single mode is going to burn at a hotter speed but much faster. And that programming is all set up inside the machine and it's critical to getting that correct or you're going to break, uh, break splices, you're going to bulge splices. Uh, so a good splice depends on how long you heat it and how hot you make it. Uh, how much and how fast the fibers are pushed together. Uh, if they're pushing too far together, that's going to cause bulges also, which will cause weaknesses. And you're going to want to make sure you've got adequate clamping in the V-grooves, whether it's fixed V-groove or that V-groove is in a fiber holder that's moving. You want to make sure that you've got a good clamp so the fibers don't move around until they are spliced. All right, alignment of the core is critical. There are some things that can cause misalignment debris in the V-groups. And we're going to talk about that next month also. Uh, coating debris on the fiber. We didn't get it stripped well enough. Uh, we're going to look at the cleave angle. could give us a bad cleave. And it could also cause misalignments. Uh, fiber curl. Some fibers, when they've been wrapped up in a tight uh, bundle somewhere in a small enclosure, uh, particularly tight buffered fibers will tend to keep a memory of that curl. And so you've got to work a little bit to position the fiber to accommodate that curl. You might have variances in the fiber diameter even within standards and any kind of fiber eccentricity. You got to watch out for all of these factors when you're watching the splicing machine. Don't trust that it's going to do all the work for you you're the human. It's up to you to watch the process as it's going and make sure that it is doing its job. Earlier I said something about the cladding will take care of itself with a once the core is aligned. Uh, that was not actually technically true and I apologize. Uh, the eccentricity corrective function on the fusion splicer needs to be engaged so as to give you the image on the left. 
which is the proper image, nice straight uh, core, the cladding can move around a little bit. If you don't have that ECF, you're going to get the images on the right uh, as the cladding tries to pull back to its uh, alignment and the cores will pass light, but that's going to be a high loss splice. So you want to make sure that it's got that ECF. Most of them do these days. Some factors that can affect splice loss. Fiber alignment, fiber cleaves, the splicer condition, especially the electrodes. Uh, again, next month when we talk about maintenance, we're going to talk about electrode changing. Uh, we're going to talk about some failures of splices and some of the causes. Uh, fiber core uh, diameter mismatch. Uh, now the last three, fiber geometry, ovality, concentricity, all of those are pretty good in this day and age. It's that old legacy fiber, a pre-97 manufacturer that had problems with these. Uh, these are probably pretty good these days and the, the operator of the machine can control the rest of this. Some tips for successful splicing. We're going to talk about what's on the splicing machine. Check the splice mode. Make sure you're telling it the proper, the proper splice program so that it burns at the correct heat and for the correct length of time. Uh, you want to make sure that you keep your optics clean. Uh, keep the V-groove uh, clean so that it doesn't kick up the tip. You want to keep the wind protector closed whenever possible. This will keep dust from getting into the uh, V-grooves and it will keep you from getting dust on your optic, on your uh, uh, cameras and lenses. You want to clean those V-grooves with, with alcohol and a swab. Protect the fiber promptly after splicing. Get that splice protective sleeve in there and get it shrunk on so you're not wobbling and wiggling the fiber around and breaking it at the splice location. Electro, electrode condition is absolutely critical, especially in harsh outdoor environments, so you want to change those about every 1,000 arcs. Now, cleaning. You want to make sure when you strip and clean the fiber that you get rid of all of the acrylate coating, any kind of buffering material, oils, dust, everything. And you got to make sure that it is thoroughly clean before you cleave because it's going straight from the cleaver into the uh, fusion splicer. You want to clean the cleaver pads and the anvil periodically. Now this will give you either angle, you know, too steep an angle on your cleave. It will give you some of those those three images that we had the big X over. Uh, if you're experiencing a cleaving problem, the first thing I do is clean uh, before I even look at the blade. I've got a little acid brush, a stiff bristled, uh, metal handled. Uh, crimp down on the bristles kind of, they call them flux brushes or acid brushes. And it's got a moderately stiff bristle which makes it easy to sweep out any uh, little shards or dust that's gotten onto the pads. Uh, most cleavers have uh, 16 positions on the blade. You can get about 1,000 uh, cleaves per position. And a lot of them have three height adjustments. So after you've rotated the blade once to all 16 positions, you can raise it to the next level and it's still got enough sharpness to uh, cleave again if it's raised and then you can do that a second time. So a lot of splicers, a lot of cleavers rather today will give you up to about 48,000 cleaves before you have to replace the blade. And these small cotton swabs. Uh, such as the CS1 cotton swab that's uh, sourced here. Uh, cleanliness is absolutely essential. Those small uh, cotton swabs get into tight areas. They're great for cleaning up your optics and for uh, sweeping out the V-groups. 
So selecting the proper splicer for you. Some things to consider. Required capacity. First and foremost, how much am I going to splice? Let's be honest. How much am I going to splice? If I'm going to be doing 100 splices a day, I'm going to want to look at some of the faster, more automated systems. If I'm going to be doing a, you know, a few splices, a customer ad here and there, maybe a dozen splices a week, my, my thought process is going to be different about how much automation I want to get. I'm going to look at fiber count, fiber diameter. When we look at those four machines later, uh, we're going to look at some of them cannot handle uh, alternate diameter cables. So if you're using something other than 125, you want to make sure that the fusion splicer can handle that. Then you want to look at the splice materials that you're going to be working with, such as those um, alternative diameters. Uh, you want to look at the type whether you want to do uh, fusion splice, a single or mass fusion. Uh, I don't see any need for mechanical splices in this day and age. And then you want to look at the environment. If you're going to be outdoors, you want to make sure that you've got something that's a little more rugged, uh, that you're, uh, you've got a good uh, wind protector and a good heater that can handle the changing environment. You might be working aerial, uh, buried, wall mount, rack mount. You may need something more compact. Uh, working in closets, I find that I like a little machine where I've got all everything built into it, and that makes life a ton easier rather than an alcohol bottle and a stripper and a cleaver and a splicing machine all trying to be balanced on the top of a ladder while I'm working inside a closet. And uh, one of the machines we'll talk about in the, this final section uh, will look at that uh, very issue. So here, here's the banner that uh, Jessica put together to advertise our uh, get together today. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the features of each of these four. Now there are a, a wide variety of splicers out there. I just find these to be somewhat representative of the splicing, uh, splicers that are out there today. The Fuji Cora 70S. This is by many considered the uh, Cadillac or Lamborghini of the splicers. Uh, it is probably the most expensive, it is the most automated. Uh, the wind protector and the a heater will automatically close and then will automatically open up when it's done with whatever it thinks it wants to do. Unfortunately, it does that sometimes when I'm not ready for it and it has nipped at my fingers or it has thrown splices back out when I wasn't ready to do something with them. Uh, I tend to want to do stuff for myself. So some of the automation on this machine is a little frustrating, but uh, it is a solid machine. It does uh, very quick burns. It uh, comes with some onboard training videos. Uh, the splice that it comes in has an integrated workstation built into it and it will do approximately 200 splice and shrink operations on a single battery, uh, which is a pretty significant number of splices. Now, the precision rated optics uh, or Pro 790, it does about 120 splice and shrink operations on a battery. It's got a pretty fast 8 second splice time. Uh, that's one of the fastest I've seen out there. It is compact and it is rugged. It is intended to go out in the field. It's meant to be handled by guys like me that, that you know, rough things up. It does use the PAS technology, and again, it is one of the more solid, uh, bargain-priced machines uh, out on the market today. Now you got the Sumitomo Type 25. This one is V-Groove alignment. 
uh, will automatically compensate for environmental conditions. Uh, it does have an auto calibrate mode or an auto um, arc calibration. So it does a little feedback on every, uh, every fusion it does and evaluates the strength of its own arc and will adjust according to temperature and air pressure. Uh, it does have to have the 125 cladding. This is one of the machines that cannot uh, deal with the other uh, core diameter or cladding diameters. And it gives you about 60 splice and shrink operations on a battery. Now I mentioned earlier the all-in-one unit that is a whole lot easier to work uh, in tight environments. Uh, this is the precision rated optics not 950S and it does also come in a ribbon or R version. Uh, it looks identical. Uh, to be totally honest with you, if it wasn't for the labeling you wouldn't be able to tell the S from the R until you open the screen or open the uh, uh, the lid. Uh, the all-in-one concept has your hot jacket stripper in the back, uh, the cleaver and the uh, alcohol dispenser are uh, just behind the windscreen and everything is in one place rather than having a stripper, a uh, alcohol bottle and a cleaver that are up on that same small little space that I'm trying to balance my fusion splicer uh, this was what I used on a job in one of the NFL stadiums recently uh, where we were working in closets having to work up on a ladder because the contractors that pulled the fiber didn't give us enough slack. And so we're up on top of four foot ladders trying to balance everything and this is the machine that I used and I was holding my own with a guy using a Fuji 60R. So it is a good solid machine at nine seconds splice time. It's not the fastest in the industry but in that environment, those two extra seconds really didn't cost me that much. And it can be purchased, the single is a PAS, and the ribbon is of course V-Groove as all ribbon machines are. And it does about 320 uh, splice and shrink operations on a battery, so uh, properly taken care of, that's probably a couple of days worth of work for most of us. So. With all of that, I want to thank everyone for being here and open the floor for questions. Uh, there is a questions block at the bottom of the screen on your little GoToWebinar box. So if you've got any questions, uh, go ahead and type those in. Now we did have a, a question that was emailed in to us and it's asking about the companies that manufacture the LIDS uh, fusion splicers. And there's not, actually not a lot of them. Uh, I mentioned that problem with the injecting light through certain uh, certain cladding or uh, certain acrylate coatings. Uh, that has uh, continued to be a problem and has never been completely solved. Uh, the companies that do manufacture, I think Aurora still makes one, and they use uh, they make them one at a time at a one at a time price and uh, they're kind of a specialty unit so in reality the biggest bulk of the fusion splicers that are out there in the field in core alignment are going to be PAS. And another question that came in by email uh, this person asks uh, I've heard people talking about PM splicers and I and and I didn't mention it. So uh, so what are PM splicers? Uh, let's see. The PM splicers are polarization maintaining, and uh, let's and they are uh, they can work with some of the larger fibers. There's some um, I think Panda fiber is one of the brands. It's I got some built-in strength members and it needs that special uh, polarization maintaining uh, fusion splicer. These are typically used only in a, a bench top 
uh, indoor environment, uh, laboratory, and that sort of thing. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, let's see, in the chat box, uh, are there 12 fiber ribbon core alignment fusion splicers? Okay, I, yeah, we did cover that a little bit in the, uh, in the webinar itself, but what happens is we don't have the technology when we've got 12 fibers that are 125 or 250 microns, including the acrylate coating. You shove 12 of those together, you're looking at what, three, four centimeters, three centimeters, and getting 48 motors that could individually grip and handle uh, the, you know, the, the individual fibers would cause, well, we just don't have that technology to get motors that small yet. And let's see, another question, is it diff or how difficult is it to correct a non-reflective event with high loss? Oh, it's not difficult at all. You break it and re-splice it. Now, there's nothing to be done about correcting it. If, it's got a, if, if you do a burn and it's got a high loss, um, you've got to break it and re-splice. That's all there is. Uh, someone's asking about getting access to the slide presentation. And I want to remind everybody that this webinar will be available on demand in about a week. It typically takes us about a week to get the recording, get it edited, get it put together. So uh, look about a week from today, you should be able to go to www.fiberoptic.com slash webinars and find the on-demand uh, webinars, all of the series that we've already done, including today, should be available by the by a week from today. Let's see. Uh, when the fiber is cut in the street and the engineers have to re-splice it, are most of these splicers uh, the V-groove type? Uh, depending on the fiber count, I would probably still look at having a, uh, a core alignment machine. I think the core alignment machines are typically going to be faster, more reliable, and I would use, um, you know, basically any of the core alignments. Again, uh, if you're going to be splicing in a street cut, you're going to be looking at a small and uh, small enclosed space, so that 950s. Uh, might be a good little machine to use uh, to work in that environment. And let's see, all right then, the final question I'm seeing in the chat room is actually for uh, sales, and I will pass that question along uh, to our sales department from uh, Michael. Uh, you can also email sales at fiberoptic.com and tell them that you attended this webinar and ask them that question. And do I have um, price range on the four models? That's also an email question to sales at fiberoptic.com. I'm here for training and I'm not, I'm not here for sales, so I will let you speak with those guys. And again, that is sales at fiberoptic.com if you have questions about uh, you know, purchasing or prices, if you have questions about the technology of the webinar or anything that we've discussed in the webinar, uh, then you can email those questions to training at fiberoptic.com. All right, well, I don't see any more questions. I want to thank everyone for being with us today and participating. Um, we know that your time is valuable and you have a lot of things to do and you, you chose to spend time with us today and uh, I want to say thank you. So with that, have a great afternoon and we will look forward to seeing you here next month when we're talking about uh, fusion splicer and splicer equipment maintenance. Take care.